to call a convention of states to essentially restrict the power and jurisdiction of the federal government effectively returning the citizens' rightful power over the ruling elite in our own individual states. That's what this is all about. And joining us now to talk about it is Mark Meckler. Now, Mark Meckler it was the co-founder and a, a national coordinator for the Tea Party Patriots, which is the largest Tea Party organization in the nation back in 2012. And more recently, he founded an organization designed to revolutionize American government by returning to its uh, founding principles. It's uh, Citizens for Self-Governance. They were founded also in 2012, in February of 2012. And this initiative is focused on expanding and assisting the nonpartisan self-governance movement. And that means turning power back to the states away from the federal government. Mark joins us now right here on AM 1420, The Answer. Good morning, Mark. How are you, sir? Good morning. I'm fantastic. It's an exciting week, Bob. I can't even imagine how much that... Well, first of all, let's go there. Let's get a little background before we talk about what's going to happen on Wednesday. This this uh, movement, this idea, the organization of uh, CSG was born in 2012. How and why? Well, as you said, I came out of the Tea Party movement like so many. I wasn't engaged in politics before. A lot of great stuff came out of the Tea Party movement, but in the end, we were missing something because we sent all these great folks to Washington, D.C., biggest turn in Congress since 38 in 2010, got the Senate in 2014, and then nothing really seemed to change. And it was pointed out to me by a very smart man, Mike Ferris, the chancellor of Patrick Henry College, founder of the homeschool movement in America, Mm -hmm. that we had a structural problem not a personnel problem, that we had broken the rules of this incredible system that the founders set up for us back in 1787, and we'd broken them so badly that, honestly, it didn't matter all that much who was in D.C. Of course, we need the best we can get, but if you don't fix the structure, you're going to get a broken result. And the Constitution provides that the only way to fix that structure when you have a Supreme Court that's out of control, a feckless Congress, an executive with too much power, the only way is for the people to assert themselves using Article 5 of the Constitution. We have seen the growth of federal government in this country before. It happened in the 1990s, uh, uh, most recently, and uh, and it has grown out of control. It did grow out, out of control during that time. Why has no one ever brought up Article 5 before? Well, I think the issue is it's a high bar. And so I think most people have looked at it and said, look, you have to get 34 states to make the application. That's a high bar, two-thirds of the states. You have to get 38 states to ratify anything. It takes somebody with an incredibly big vision to say that this can even be accomplished. Mike Ferris is the guy who brought that project to me. You have to remember, Mike is the guy who back in the late 70s or early to late 70s when homeschooling was illegal in all 50 states, Ferris is the guy that said that was wrong, we had to fix it, and he did fix it. So he has that kind of vision, and that's what it takes. And it also takes the political muscle and the organizational skill, and that's what I brought to the table by having helped build out the Tea Party Patriots to 23 million members around the country. Wow, I didn't realize that was the number. That is fantastic to hear, by the way. Mark Meckler, again, co-founded the Tea Party Patriots, and now we're talking about his organization, CSG, Citizens for Self-Governance. So let's talk about uh, what, uh, why Article 5 is relevant to what's going on in America today. Why, what, what examples do you have for us that say the federal government is out of control and we need to return power to the states and give people the chance to self-govern? Sure. So I think there there are some really fundamental things, and I think the the guy that described it best was George Mason, who proposed this in 1787. I mean, he had the foresight. The founders had the foresight. He stood up in convention on September 15, 1787, and he asked this question. He, the the document at that time he, he saw a flaw. He said we'd only given the federal government the power to propose amendments and not the states. And were we so naive that we believe that a government that becomes a tyranny will propose amendments to restrain its own tyranny? I imagine they all laughed, because nobody restrains their own tyranny. And so he proposed Article 5, the second clause, which gives us this power. And specifically, let me give you some very specific examples. There is nowhere in the Constitution where the federal government is authorized to be engaged in, in the pursuit of educating. So the Department of Education does not exist in the Constitution. It's not within the enumerated powers, except, and, except the Supreme Court has said it is. And Thomas Jefferson himself said the federal government may not be involved in education without an amendment. We don't have such an amendment, but we have the Education Department. We have the Commerce Department. We have the Energy Department. These huge departments like the EPA that regulate our businesses to death are not explicitly authorized anywhere in the Constitution. And the only way to change that, the only way to take that power away from the federal government is through an Article 5 convention. So if your listeners believe that the federal government has too much power Well, yes, it's important they vote for the right people, but taking that power away takes more than the right people. It takes structural reform that can only come through Article 5. 
So what we're doing this week then, or what you are doing this week, what CSG is doing in uh, in Virginia is you're having a dry run, right? This is uh, this is going to be an actual simulation of an Article Five Convention of States. Tell us what that means. What are you going to accomplish over the three days of Thursday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday front? Sure. So over the last three years, we've built out a grassroots activist base of 1.45 million people. We have supporters in literally every single state legislative district in the country. It's never been done before in any project. We're particularly strong there in Ohio. So the grassroots are in place. The education is in place. People can read all about it at conventionofstates.com. And then there are legislators all over the country that are supporting it. We have this going on in all 50 states around the country, already passed in eight states. Now it's time to get folks together as commissioners to a convention. And since it's never been done before, let's do it. Let's do the dry run and see how it operates. One correction I want to make to your introduction, which was virtually perfect, by the way, is just to add that now we have commissioners coming from all 50 states. Every state is participating, mostly legislators and prior legislators from all 50 states. We're going to get together in Colonial Williamsburg. That's where the ideas that founded this country came from. We're going to get together there. We're going to have a three-day convention Wednesday night, just a little meet and greet Thursday. We go into main session and break out in committees Friday. Amendments will be presented to the main body and voted on, and hopefully some will be passed out of that convention. Uh, and we're glad to hear that, by the way, that correction, that all 50 states are represented now, not just 48. And in fact, just for those who would like to know, the Ohio commissioners who are going to the Convention of State Simulation are Bill Patman uh, from Cleveland, Representative uh, Christina Hagen from Alliance, and Representative Margaret Condit from Liberty Township, which is down, I don't know, hold on a second, we haven't, yeah, I'm sorry about that, we had an audio glitch. Uh, and uh, um, uh, Representative Condit is from the Liberty Township, Cincinnati area, so they're going to be attending this uh, on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday as well. Why is it, Mark, so important for citizens to recognize that the, the, the answer is no longer just to elect the right people to the federal government, to send the right people to the House and to the Senate, and they'll do our work for us? Why is that no longer uh, you know, the route that we can trust? Well, you know, because we've done it. And we did it big time in 2010, and we did it in 2014. What the folks who go to D.C. keep telling us is, oh, you know, if you just do it once more, things are going to work out okay. But that is, as you know, the old cliche, the very definition of insanity, do the same thing over again and hope for a different result. By the way, Bob, that's exactly what the folks in D.C. want us to do. Just fight in the election, pay attention only to the election. After the election, they want us to go away and go home, let them play the games, because in that game, they all get rich, they all succeed, and the people are the ones who pay the price. So they want the status quo. And when I say they, I mean mostly people in both parties. Now, of course, not guys like Jim Jordan. There are some real heroes there. But most of them, the machine in Washington, D.C., wants to maintain the status quo. We're talking to Mark Meckler. Mark, uh, I've got a couple more quick questions for you, but I need to get a traffic here. Can you hang on for just a moment or two? Absolutely. All right, I appreciate that. Mark Meckler, again, is uh, one of the nation's leading grassroots activists. His work uh, actually co-founded the Tea Party Patriots, now the largest Tea Party organization in America, as he pointed out, with some 23 million members. And he has now organized CSG, uh, Citizens for Self-Governance, and they are putting together an amazing event, the first unprecedented uh, Convention of States simulation in Virginia this week, taking back our government from those federal overlords, if you will, in Washington, D.C. Mark Meckler is with us. Mark is a uh, grassroots activist, one of the best in the business uh, in that regard. He helped, through grassroots organizations, um, found the uh, Tea Party Patriots, founded the Tea Party Patriots, and is the um, national coordinator for that organization. Also, put together Citizens for Self-Governance, which is a grassroots initiative focused on expanding and assisting the self-governance movement. In other words, getting us away from the over-control of the, of the federal government and uh, in so many different areas, from education, as we discussed in the last segment, to the EPA and more. Uh, we want to return power to the states and to the people to govern themselves. Uh, and Mark has a tremendous event with CSG coming up this weekend, or excuse me, this week, from Wednesday through Friday. It's called uh, the Convention of the States under Article 5. Uh, of the Constitution, a convention of the states. This is going to be a simulation, however, with uh, representatives from all 50 states uh, joining together. Now, Mark, uh, in the last segment, we talked about some of the goals uh, of the of the uh, convention of states simulation. Can you give us some of the examples, everyday examples that people uh, can process easily of government overreach, where a convention of the states could actually come up with a solution and say, this is the answer to federal government overreach? Give us some examples. Sure, and there are some some recent ones that I think are really important. And first of all, is just simply budgetary. 
the federal government is fiscally out of control. Every single day they spend more money than they take in. Every year our debt gets deeper. Uh, today we're in excess on the books of $19 trillion. A lot of people would say $140 trillion in debt if you count all the off-book uh, unaccounted for liabilities. And the only way that's going to stop is if we, the people, stop it. And so one of the things that could be imposed by a convention is a legitimate balanced budget amendment. Some people fear that, and they say, well, they'll tax us to death. You can literally build in. You can't raise taxes to balance the budget, or you can only raise based on inflation or population growth. Mm -hmm. And so a balanced budget amendment is likely to come out of it. Another thing would be term limits. Eighty percent of Americans support some sort of term limits for Congress. And I would add, also importantly, I think term limits for the Supreme Court and the other federal courts. 80% of Americans support those things. Congress will never do that to itself. If the people want it, then we have to do it. And then the third area, and to me the most important area, is scope and jurisdictional limitations on the federal government. So we've got, for example, Common Core being imposed all across the country. We can specific, specifically prohibit, through a convention, Congress's and, and the federal government's involvement in education in any way, shape, or form. We should drive that back to the states, let the states and the people closest to the kids who are being educated be in control of those kids' education. Mark, explain this to me, um, to borrow a line from a great movie, like I'm a four-year-old. Um, let's say that the Convention of the States holds uh, uh, this, this conference under, under Article 5, and you come up with a number of these things. Let's choose the term limits one, for example. And you're right, Congress won't do this to themselves. How does the work, how does it work? What is the process? So the, the Convention of States gets together and they come up with this is one of their, their platforms or their issues or their items, whatever you want to call it. And we want term limits for Congress, for the House and for the Senate, and whatever the number is. How does it like work its way through the system then? How, how does it, how does it take, take, um, uh, how does it supersede the rules of Congress? Sure. So the way that works, uh, you get into convention, as you described, it takes 34 states to call convention. Mm -hmm. They have debates like any legislature. They propose a particular amendment. When it comes out of convention, it takes a majority of states to get it out of convention, so it takes 26 states. And whatever that language is then becomes a suggested amendment. And that suggestion goes out to the states for ratification. People are familiar with the ratification process from all the amendments we have in the Constitution now. This is sure. no different. Sure. It takes 38 states to ratify. That's three-quarters of the states. In order to ratify, it takes both houses of each state to vote on it. It doesn't take the governor, just both houses of each state to vote on it and ratify that amendment to add their name to it. And in the end, it takes 38 states. When the 38th state ratifies that, then it becomes part of the Constitution. So those term limits would become and there's nothing that the federal nothing that the federal legislature, that the Congress can do to block that? Absolutely nothing. The president isn't involved. Congress isn't involved. And importantly, the courts aren't even involved. Yeah, and then that is very important, especially like you talked about, because that's one of the things I could see a lot of, you know, coming out of a convention of states is, is you know, some sort of limitation on the lifetime appointments, for example, to su Supreme Court members. That is one of the things that we talk about now in this election cycle. For those of us who are very, very worried, not just about the next four years, but the next 40 years. And and for myself, as a conservative-minded individual, I worry about uh, a very, very progressive or liberal Supreme Court that Hillary Clinton might appoint that would change the uh, future for not only, you know, the next generation, but the next two or or three, that is of great concern to me. And the founders, in their wisdom, for whatever reason, decided these would be lifetime appointments, and that might be something that we have to visit. Yeah, absolutely. And the reason that the founders did that, by the way, is simply a matter of actuarials. In other words, in, in 1787, the average age of an appointee to the Supreme Court or the federal courts was 47, and life expectancy was 54. In, in their wildest imaginations, they couldn't have anticipated people living to 80 years and beyond on average, and so th there was no need for any kind of a term limit on the courts, and so that's why they didn't do it. Would, would uh, and, and uh, maybe I'm getting into the weeds here on this, but if there was to be a proposal to change or to impose term limits on uh, on Supreme Court justices, um, would it be, would it, would they change, or would the idea be to, to change the way they are appointed, or just that after their term ends, the president appoints them in the same process now going through the Senate Judiciary Committee, et cetera? You know, I've heard ideas for both, changing the process, changing the composition, and normal, what you would consider uh, just standard kinds of term limits, maybe a 12-year 12, 12 term limit 
or the court rotating in thirds or something like that. So it's really it's going to be up to the people who convene in convention, and then most importantly, right. up to the people in the states to decide whether they approve it. Because the one thing we don't want to ever have is is uh, the Supreme Court become political, where to the point where they actually are. Hey, I know I'm term limited, so therefore I you know I don't I don't want to have to be elected. We don't want them to be elected positions because obviously then they're going to make rules based on popularity, but rather as opposed to what the Constitution says. Absolutely. Rulings, and you know, me. remember that it's important, Bob, that we remember that this actual resolution is pending in Ohio. Ohio right now. So folks who are listening, this is not some theoretical exercise. You actually have this pending in your own legislature, and you have the opportunity to have an impact on the process. Wow, that is uh, that is very important to know. Uh, how can people get involved in this if they wanted to uh, to follow it or support it or what have you, the Article 5 uh, Convention of State Simulation? Sure. So specifically, people go to cosaction.com, sign the petition. That'll let your own legislators know what's going on. We have HJR3 is awaiting a final vote in the House Government Accountability and Oversight Committee. The key players in this, you know, you'll know these names, Speaker Rosenberger and Senate President Keith favor. They both indicated sure. they're favorable, but we're not seeing them push it forward. So anybody who wants to contact those folks, contact those folks, let them know they support it. Contact the folks on the Government uh, Accountability and Oversight Committee. Uh, I think the new chair is probably going to be a uh, representative blessing. And so it's really important. Get involved. Go to cosaction.com. Get signed up. Get engaged. It's not just up to you and, and me, Bob. It's up to your listeners. This is a place this for, for self-governance. That's why we're called Citizens for Self-Governance. If you don't get involved, nothing's going to change. Yeah, so that's COSAction.com, but also the uh, ConventionOfStates.com as well. That website uh, really kind of explains what Article 5 is and what the issues are and what the solutions are, correct? That's correct. Both of those websites are critical. Very wonderful. We'll share those on social media as well, and we'll put it up on the website. Uh, Mark, really appreciate your time and uh, and the detailed explanation you gave, because uh, for those of us who are believers that the federal government has grown out of control, um, this might be the only way to rein it in. This might be, because we certainly can't count on the uh, people we... You know, we sent a bunch of Tea Party... Uh, supported uh, 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 legislators to Congress in 2012, or actually in 2010, and then in 2014 we we grew that number. We gave them even more support, and in the uh, gave uh, the Republicans and you know Tea Party support in the Senate as well, and they have not gotten it done. So it's going to take more than just sending the right people or what we think are the right people to D.C. And the Convention of States might be that answer. Uh, Mark Meckler, thank you so much for everything you're doing. Best of luck to you in Virginia over the uh, course of uh, Wednesday through Friday, and we look forward to seeing the results. Thanks again, Bob. All the best. Thank you, Mark. The Founding Fathers knew this might happen. Article 5 of the Constitution gives the states the power to stop a runaway federal government, a convention of states to amend the Constitution. It's the only solution as big as the problem. It's time to stand up, speak up, and show up.